We have been in a sermon series on prayer. And in this sermon series on prayer, we've had now three separate installments of this sermon series on prayer. The first installment uh, was entitled, Why Pray? And we simply tried to look at the biblical reasons why we should pray. And we said the foundational reason for the Christian to pray is for the glory of God. And our emphasis there was to show you that prayer is a means by which God brings himself glory, but also to show us that prayer it should be God-oriented and not man-centered. Prayer is about alignment, getting our wills in alignment with God's will. So then we moved from this first installment of Why Pray to the second installment of this series on prayer, which said, Lord, teach us to pray. That was the request made by one of the disciples of Jesus Christ. And that's when Jesus Christ told his disciples, pray then in this manner, manner, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And we learn the disciples' prayer or the model prayer, should we say. Then for a brief moment, we look at the real Lord's prayer in John chapter 17. And Jesus prayed for unity among the church. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then the third installment, which we are in today, is called the power of prayer. The power of prayer. Last week, Pastor Josh uh, Samsel preached uh, from Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, the Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And this promise we have is the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding with God and keep our hearts and Christ Jesus. And so last week, we learned that prayer is so powerful that it is the answer for our anxiety. Whatever anxiety, worry, stress you have, Jesus says, Paul says to us, don't be anxious, instead pray. And prayer has the power to give you peace even in the midst of your storm. And so now we turn to the book of James, chapter 5, and he's going to show us more of the power of prayer. So if you have your Bibles, I would ask that you would turn, swipe, or flip there. James, chapter 5, beginning with verse number 13. James chapter 5, beginning with verse number 13, we'll read from the English Standard Version. And while our custom here at the Bridge Church is to stand in honor and reverence to, most, to God's most holy word, we believe that when Scripture is read, we are hearing God speak himself. Even now, today, in 2018, if you want to hear the voice of God, open up his word. And here is how God speaks through James, the brother of Jesus, in James chapter 5, beginning with verse number 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. 
And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may have your seat. Jumping right into this text, I've got two points this morning. Let's see how long it takes. James first gives us, in this text, the prescription of prayer. He first gives us the prescription of prayer in verses 13 through 14. In this prescription of prayer, in this first section, he first outlines the person's role, the individual person's role. Look at verse 13. He opens up with this question, is any among you suffering? Is any of you experiencing trouble of any kind is the writer's question. In some of the trials and tribulations, James addresses in his letter include discrimination, economic exploitation, temptations of various kinds, quarreling, slander. All of these were types of temptations and trials that people were experiencing. And James' admonition to his readers and us today is if anyone is experiencing any kind of suffering, pray. Well, notice here what he does not say to do. He doesn't say if you are experiencing suffering, complain. He doesn't say if you are suffering, be bitter. He doesn't say if you are suffering, blame God. He says, get on your knees and talk to God about your suffering. The prescription, church, for dealing with suffering of any kind is for the person suffering to pray. That's what Peter told us when he says that we can cast all of our cares upon him because he cares for us. And so he says, if you're suffering, pray. The next question posed by James in verse 13 is this. Is anyone cheerful? To be cheerful is to be happy, to be in a state of peace because you're free from suffering at the moment. The individual's responsibility, even in the season of cheerfulness, is to sing praises to God. This, this word, these, this, the word sing praise in the original language, it is one word. It's solo, P-S-A-L-L-O. That's where we get our word song. And so in, in a song, it's simply prayer that's put to music. It is a song of Praise through prayer. So, so, so James says, even when you are experiencing peace from suffering, you still owe God praise. I wonder why James would include being in a, when you are uh, uh, being in a state of cheerfulness in his letter. Two reasons, I believe. Because oftentimes in seasons of prosperity, we are prone to forget about God. In seasons of prosperity, we we tend to become lax in our relationship with God, which is why sometimes God makes us desperate for him by sending us through seasons of suffering. And James reminds us here, he says, in your season of cheerfulness, don't forget about God. Sing praises to God for giving you a season of peace from suffering. The second reason I believe he includes cheerfulness here, even though he talks about primarily negative events in the life of a believer, is because he's introducing to us two extremes of human life. 
seasons of suffering and seasons of cheerfulness. In other words, this is James' way of saying to us that in all circumstances, we ought to pray. In our acknowledging and in our prayer, we acknowledge that God is sovereign over every season of life. The suffering and the sunny, he's sovereign. Oh, I like that. That came up with that on the spot. Friends, the whole of Christian life is to be lived in constant communion with God. And so now in this prescription of prayer, he now moves to verse 14 and he has another question for the audience. Is any among you sick? Now, we get into more of the difficult part of this text because theologians and interpreters of Scripture have gone back and forth about the meaning of this term sick. Some take it to mean spiritual sickness. It, it, it is a, a picture of the person who has become spiritually weak. And the rest of this passage is talking about how to restore a weaker brother. And there are some reasons to believe that in this text. However, others say that it's not talking about spiritual sickness, but rather he's referring to physical sickness. And that's the way I read this verse, that he's saying that if there's someone who is physically sick among you, what's our response? Here we go. Your responsibility, the responsibility of the sick person is to call for the elders of the church. Why? Because they can pray for you. Now, before we move too quickly through this, I think it's important here to do some basic observation and application because so many people in the church have been hurt because their pastor or pastors did not come and visit them during their time of sickness. So James, first of all, James has given us the person's role and the individual person's role in the prescription of sickness. But now he's giving us the pastor's role. And we, that's elders. Remember, we said pastors are elders and elders are pastors. The terms are used synonymously in Scripture. So the pastor's role in Scripture is to pray over the sick. Now, notice here, who bears the responsibility when a believer is sick? He says, let him call for the elders of the church. It is the sick person's responsibility to inform the elders that they have a serious sickness and call for them to pray over them. Friends, let me make it very clear. It is your responsibility to inform the elders of your sickness. You cannot expect your pastors to be all-knowing. A few years ago, I forgot my wife's birthday. I didn't need that amen. If I forget that, then I sure don't know when you are sick unless you tell me. And I don't want to, 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 to just brush off people who have been hurt by the church. I don't, want, I don't want you to think that I'm saying this is your fault. But the text makes it very clear. It is your responsibility to make it known to your spiritual leaders so that they can come and pray over you. I'm trying to help y'all help me. It is the responsibility of the person that is sick to make their sickness known. So James says, now let me make something else very clear. You ought to call the elders of the church to pray over you, but I don't think James is seeing any kind of sickness. You ought not call your elders over a cold. I believe James is saying when you have some extremely serious 
sickness. That's when you call for the elders of the church. And I believe I'm on good ground here. I'm taking this from the text. Remember, here's why I think it's, it's something that's really serious. He says, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them. Here's the thing. The person is so sick that they can't get to the elders, so the elders have to come to them. That's one clue in the text. A second clue in the text is that this is a pretty extreme sickness is that the elders are called to pray over the sick person. Why would he, uh, the elders have to pray over the sick person? Because that person is likely lying flat on their back. Because they are so sick. Verse 15 provides us with another clue. After the elders pray in faith, the promise is that the Lord will heal the sick person and the Lord will raise him up. Why would the Lord have to raise him up? Because he's been lying down. He, he, he is immobile more than likely. So you need to call your elders to pray over you when there is some serious sickness that you are suffering from. Now, I wish I could give you all an exhaustive list of the conditions of which you should call your elders. But I don't have one. Because it's going to differ from person to person and case to case. What you have to do is exercise wisdom. But, what, but I'm not a very wise person. Well, then read the first part, the first chapter of James. If any of you lack wisdom, ask of God, who gives generously, by the way. So your elders want to come and pray for you. But if we prayed over every time you stumped your big toe, we would never do our actual duty of having spiritual oversight of the church. So then what's the pastor's role? Verse 14 says, they are to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. Remember, the elders, the pastors, their primary ministry, their primary duty as an elder is to pray. The second most important ministry of an elder is the ministry of the word. We get that from Acts 6. The primary ministry of your elders, and I'm just pastoring the Bridge Church right now, the primary ministry of your elders is the ministry of prayer and the ministry of the word. Rewind, press play. The primary ministries of your elders is the ministry of prayer and the ministry of the word. For a new church, I don't make any assumptions. The primary ministry of the elders is not to just serve as a board of directors and handle the business of the church and to be the decision makers of the church. The primary ministry of the elders is the ministry of prayer and word in that order. One way they exercise that ministry of prayer in pastoral care is to physically go to the sick who have informed them of their condition and to pray over them. Why the elders, though? And why not the prayer warriors of the church? Because the elders should be the prayer warriors of the church. The elders, but also I believe James is calling for the elders of the church because the elders should have some of the most mature faith in the congregation. Elders do not have the privilege of being able to lead from a position of fear. Fear directly contradicts faith. So the last thing I should hear elders saying is, well, I don't want us to do this because I fear. I fear. Elders should be some of the have some of the most, have some of the biggest faith in the congregation. 
So that's why you would call on those men to come and pray over you because it's the prayer of faith that brings healing. And if an elder does not have that kind of faith, great faith, then it may be indication that they need more training and developing in time. Now notice here, that the role of the elder is to pray over them, and the prayer that they're praying is a prayer for healing. Brandon, why do you want us to notice that? Because that is a bold prayer when praying over a person that is terminally ill. And one thing that I want us to leave this sermon series from is being able to pray boldly to our Heavenly Father. Too often, we are too, too safe in our prayer life. Notice here that we don't, he, he, he doesn't say just pray that they would be comforted during their sickness. He doesn't pray for that they would just have strength during their uh, sickness. That they don't just pray for endurance. To, to bear up under this sickness. Those things are good and well, and we ought to pray for that. But the prayer of the elders is that this person would be healed. Friends, I want us as people of God and people of faith to have great faith when we go to our great God. Some of our prayers are just too daggum saints. Why? Because we don't want to risk being disappointed by God. We, 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 we want to be just like Burger King. We want to just have it our way. God, this is what I want. Do it for me. And so we don't want to be disappointed by God. So we say, let me give him something that's easy. I'm going to give him a layup. And if he's like any of the 13-year-olds I saw this weekend, those are not easy. <laughs> uh. But I also think we pray too safe because we don't want to risk the chance of making God look bad. Friends, let me just help you on this morning. God don't need that ministry from you. God can take care of himself. He doesn't need you to protect his reputation by praying safely. He won't need us to be people of great faith because he's a great God. Remember, this is the God that's able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. So God wants you to pray bold so that he can even blow your mind and show you that as bold as you want, you still pray too safely. Maybe the reason you pray so safely is because your God is too small. And the God of the Bible, the God that we serve, is the God that can heal a woman who's been hemorrhaging with blood for 12 years. The God that we serve is the God that can give sight to the blind, those who were blind from birth. The God that we serve is the God that can speak to dead people and say, Lazarus, come forth, and the dead have to come back to life. That's the kind of God that we serve. So church, pray bold. Shoot, if you want to see the power of God, look at one another right now because he saved your sinful, sin, uh, filthy self and he, he can give life to your dead soul that he can heal any sickness. Matter of fact, here's the way the great uh, Bishop G.E. Patterson, look him up sometime, he will bless your soul. He told his church, if you can have it, God can heal it. Friends, I don't care what it is. I don't care what the doctor said. If they tell you there is no cure, the devil is a liar. I serve a God who can cure anything. There is nothing too hard for my God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So this was about the elders praying. I'm sorry. Their responsibility is to pray and anoint with oil. Oh, Lord, here we go. What's this all about? This anointing with oil. There are three primary views or interpretations of this anointing with oil. Let me give them to you. One interpretation 
is that anointing with oil is for medicinal purposes. It's medicine. In the ancient world, oil was used as both a skin conditioner and the medicine. We see a likely medicinal use of oil in the story of the Good Samaritan. Remember, the Good Samaritan shows up, and when he reaches the man who had been beaten and robbed, the text says in Luke that he went to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. So that's one view, is that the oil is for medicinal purposes. A second view is what we call the sacramental view. This is the interpretation by many of Roman Catholics. The Roman church from this text gave priests the exclusive right to use oil to anoint the sick for the purpose of removing any remnant of sin and strengthening the soul for dying. The problem with that view is that James tells the elders to anoint them with oil for the purpose of healing of the body, not preparing the soul for death. Third interpretation is that anointing with oil serves a symbolic purpose. Remember, in the Old Testament, anointing with oil often symbolizes the consecration of persons or objects for God's use and service. We see this in Exodus 28. When God tells Moses, he says, uh, set aside for me Aaron and Aaron's sons for priestly service. When God tells him to do that, he says, I want you to anoint them. And so so it is a physical act that serves a a symbolic purpose. So what is the preferred view? Well... Since no specific illness is mentioned in our text, it's hard to justify oil being used for the purpose of medicine. Remember, if if we take even the Good Samaritan story, this person had been beaten, robbed, had open wounds, and they used oil in that situation. But this is just a blanket sickness. It could be um, external or internal. And so for that reason, it's hard to believe James has in mind using oil for the purpose of medicine. The Catholic view has already been refuted. This is about healing, not dying. Well, that leaves us with only one option. The elders anoint the person with oil to symbolize that the sick person is being set apart for God's special attention in prayer. Now, I think this view is further supported because James goes on to say in verse 15 that the prayer of faith is what does the healing, not the anointing of oil. So because it's the prayer of faith that does the healing and not the oil, then it's unlikely that oil was a medicinal use. So he says the pastor's role then is to pray over them and anoint them with oil, a physical act, with a symbolic person saying this person is, a, is especially set aside for God's special attention. So that's the prescription of prayer. Secondly, James now gives us the power of prayer in verses 15 to 18. We move from the prescription of prayer to the power of prayer. The first thing he shows us in the power of prayer, he says, let me show you the effect a faithful praying. Look at the effects with me. First, verse 15, he says the sickness will be healed. Verse 15 says the prayer of faith will heal the sick and the Lord will raise him up. Hallelujah. Friends, notice here the power of praying with faith. Healing And Lord, raising up. James is showing us that God uses prayer as the means by which he accomplishes his end, which is healing of the sick person. Now, I know why y'all got so quiet. Because you're too busy squirming right now. Because, Because 
we know that healing does not always come to the person that has been prayed over. We don't have to squirm. God's got it covered. Read the text. There are some conditions tied to this promise. What are they? First, the promise of healing is tied to the prayer that's offered in faith. Faith is the crucial element here. And notice that the faith is not the faith of the person suffering. It's the faith of the elders. Now my elders are squirming. So Brandon, are we to understand that if a person is not healed after the elders have prayed over them, that the elders just did not have enough faith? Maybe. That very well could be the case. If you have some faithless elders, that could be the case. However, when elders pray in faith, we recognize that God is sovereign and will do what he wills. And sometimes, friends, God's will is not to heal that person on this side of heaven. Everybody's squirming again. Y'all join the elders again. But why would God not heal sick people? That seems so mean. Friends, I wish I had all the answers. But one thing I can tell you is that the reason he does not heal some people is because he's God and he does whatever he pleases and he knows what's best. So what this calls for us is to trust the sovereign hand of God. But at the end of the day, we cannot put all the blame on God, even though he can handle it. We must remember that sickness and death are the consequences of living in a fallen world. Who's responsible for the fall? Men. So we have to take ownership of this as well. We bring sin upon ourselves. Now, I don't have time to dig into all the details of this issue. It becomes very thorny and, and, and specific. The goal of this passage is to push us to pray boldly in faith and without doubting. And our prayers give God the occasion to display his power and receive glory. The effects of prayer is that sickness will be healed, but then look at the rest of verse 15. Not only will sickness be healed, but sins will be forgiven. James says that if the sick person has committed sins that led to the sickness, that person will be forgiven. Now, we must remember that it was believed that some sicknesses were the consequences of sin. James here is not saying, he, what he is not saying is that all sickness is the result of sin. Specific sin. But there are some situations where sickness is a direct consequence of specific sins. And so James is saying in those cases, the prayer of faith will lead to healing because God has forgiven the sin of that person. Now, for to be very clear, this has nothing to do with our salvation. James is writing to people who are already believers. So he's talking not about their salvation, but their sanctification. And so he's saying, if you have a sickness that is a direct consequence of some sin that you have committed in your life, he's saying that the prayer of faith will bring healing because God will forgive you of that sin. Why y'all so quiet on me right now? The fact that you are forgiven, you ought to say amen. Y'all want this to be neat and tidy. But here's the problem. We serve an infinite God, an all-knowing God, an all-wise God. So it's, it, it's impossible for this, this theology to be so neat and tidy because we are so finite. So then, what should we do since prayer has the power to bring forgiveness of sin? What are we to do? 
in these cases. Verse 16. If you squirmed before, you're really about to squirm now. Verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. What you doing, my brain? The Bible says right here in James chapter 5, verse 16, that because forgiveness of sin comes from praying of faith, you ought to confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Friends, this is a crucial verse. It's a verse that Western Christianity does not like. Why? Because we value individualism and privacy. And those worldly values have invaded the church so much so that we now have Christians going around saying that their faith is private. Friends, it's a lie. Don't believe it. Your faith, your walk with God is always personal, but it's never private. James here is teaching us, hear me, hear me here, is that our sanctification, us becoming more like Jesus Christ, our spiritual formation, our walk with God, here it is, is a community project. Rewind, press play. Your walk with God is a community project. It God designed it from the very beginning. What's the first not good in the Bible? It is not good for man to be alone. When you were created in the image of God, that means that you were created to live in community because that is how God exists. He exists in community. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all three of them together glorify one another. And what do we have 60 plus time in the New Testament? This one phrase, one another. Pray for one another. Confess your sins to one another. Love one another. Welcome one another. Bear the burdens of one another. Your walk with God is a community project. And so James says, you ought to confess your sins to one another, not just to get it off your chest, not just to clear your conscience, but so that your brothers and sisters in Christ can pray for you. Why? Because there is power in prayer. And when the people of God storm the gates of heaven, we gain access into the very power of God. And God unleashes all of his power and things change. The goal of communal confession is prayer and restoration. We don't do this much in the church today. But I think this is something that's missing from Western Christianity. It's communal confession. The confessing of sin can occur in a number of different contexts. It may be in a women's discipleship group. It may be in a men's discipleship group. It may be one-on-one with another believer. It may be in a bridge group. It may be during a large group gathering. Whatever the context, James says that the reason some believers are not experiencing restoration and growth is because they have not confessed their sins to one another. I don't know what else to say about that. Do it. It's risky. It's scary. Because one thing that people have gotten right about the church is we are very judgmental. And we like to judge others until it comes to us. And then we like to quote Matthew 7. Judge not that ye be not judged. Or we quote out of Romans, the Lord is my judge. Actually, you need to go back and read 1 Corinthians because we have a responsibility to judge one another as Christians. Oh, I wish I had time to unpack that. It is risky, it is scary, but friends, it is necessary for your sanctification. 
James says, some people are not experiencing healing, restoration, and breakthrough because they believe the lie that your, my faith is private. And James is saying to somebody in this room, your breakthrough is not going to come until you start confessing. That word confess is a com compound word which simply means to agree with, to say the same thing. In other words, it is I now have the same view uh, that God has about my lifestyle. And that God is holy and my actions are unholy. And as a result, I deserve some kind of consequence for my sin. And sometimes our sin is so great that we can't even pray for our own selves. That's why we got to be able to lean on one another. Because when you're weak, I can be strong for you. Because I need you to get strong because I'm going to get weak again. Hear me well. The goal of communal confession is prayer and restoration. And so James then gives us this great principle. Verse 16. He ends the verse 16 with this uh, uh, saying. The prayer of of a righteous person has great power as it's working. In other words, the prayers of righteous people are very effective. But Brandon, who's righteous? What is a righteous person? Friends, my understanding of this verse is that a righteous person is simply someone who has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Here's how he says it. He, Jesus Christ, that knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. Can I give you some theology real quick? Pastor Josh already preached this to it, but I'm going to re-preach it because I wanted to. What that verse refers to is what we call in the theology world, the dub, uh, what we call double imputation. Ha! That's what I said too when I first read it. <laughs> to impute means to charge to the account of another. It is a biblical term of accounting. Think about debits and credits. He that knew no sin, Jesus, became sin. Debits. Sin. There's this eternal moral account. And because of sin, there's this eternal ongoing debit because of sin. Jesus took our debits on the cross. He, wasn't, he did not become sinful. God treated him as if he was a sinner because he took the debits, the debt that we incurred, it was accounted or imputed to Jesus Christ, and as a result, the righteousness of Christ was credited to our account so that now I'm no longer in the negative with God, but I have completely been made right with God, and my debt has now been paid in full. And because of Jesus, as unrighteous as I am, because of Jesus, I have now been clothed in the righteousness of Christ so that when the Father sees me, he doesn't see the unrighteousness righteousness of Brandon, but he sees Brandon as righteous because he has now been clothed in the righteousness of Christ. You missed a good spot to do something because even as bad, as filthy, as sinful as we are, God sees us as righteous. And James says, you by yourself, one, you can be a one person powerhouse when you get on your knees and pray to almighty God. And God says, I hear you, my child, because now I see you clothed in my son, Jesus Christ. Notice what James has done here. He's clever. He's moved. He says, it's you. You have a personal responsibility, but then your elders have a personal responsibility, but now the whole church has a responsibility because you confess your sins to one another and you pray for one another. But wait a minute. 
the prayers of a righteous person can accomplish great things. Does that apply to me? He moves from the effects to the example now. He says, Elijah was a man with a like nature of our, as ours. What does that mean? He was simply a man, a human being. But Elijah prayed that it would not rain. And guess what? Because of the prayer of one righteous person, all it takes is one church. Because of the prayer of one righteous person, it did not rain for three years and six months. Because of one righteous person. And then Elijah said, all right, God, I need some rain now. And because of the prayer of one righteous person, rain fell down from heaven. And James is simply saying, if God can do, if one man can pray, a man with a like nature as us, human being, flesh, if he can do that, think about what we can do individually. And then as leaders and also, but as a church, when we pray, the windows of heaven will be open when the people of God pray. Church, my simple message is this. Prayer changes things. There is power in prayer. When the people of God pray, things change. So James has simply said the prayer of a righteous person accomplishes much question for the room. Are you a righteous person? It is not based on necessarily your lifestyle, your merit. What he's talking about here is simply somebody who has just been simply clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And as a result, now that person will have a right lifestyle, but too often we want to start with our behavior, but really we should start with belief. And so for somebody in here today, for you to tap into the power of prayer, the first thing you need to do is be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. The only way to be in right standing with God is to put, completely put your trust and dependence on Jesus Christ and him alone. There is no other way to become a righteous person in the sight of God than to believe and trust in Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ himself lived a perfect life, he lived in perfect obedience to God, which is the requirement to be in right standing with God. And we know, you know you, that it, you are not perfect by any stretch, but you can be seen and treated as perfect through Jesus Christ, your Lord. And the simple requirement today is to trust in Jesus Christ and him alone. Not your good works, not your mom or your daddy, not giving to charities, not feeding the poor. Those things are good. But what you need more than anything is to be forgiven for your sin. And the only way to be forgiven for your sin in order to be right with God is through complete trust and dependence on Christ. There is no other way. At that moment, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are clothed then with the righteousness of Christ. And now you get to spend eternity with God. But now you have power right now that you can go to God in prayer and pray big to Almighty God and watch Him change things. You will be able to sing with us what a friend we have in Jesus. All of our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. All because we do not take it to God in prayer. And so for somebody in this room today, what you need more than anything is to be in right relationship with God. And so God calls for you today to trust in him, 
because you deserve eternal separation from God in hell. But you can be right with God through Jesus Christ. For those of you who are already believers, James pushes us today that if you're suffering, pray about it. If you're cheerful, happy, things are going well, then you owe God praise. If you're sick to the point to where you're immobilized, it has dramatically changed your life, James says, call for the elders of the church and let them pray over you and anoint you with oil. But if the sickness that you are dealing with today is because of some sin in your life, James says you need to confess it. so that the body can pray for you. Pray bold. And watch God work. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that we who have responded by faith have been clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And now, we are righteous in your sight because of a great exchange. Christ became sin. We became righteous. So thank you, Father, that we have such a great salvation. And because we are righteous, we know that we have the privilege of prayer. We can bring anything to you. And we can have great expectations that you will change things. So God, give us a heart for prayer. Help us to slow down in life so that we can pray. Help us to never resist the urge to pray because it gives an opportunity to display your power and your glory. God, Brother Jonathan has already confessed corporate sins today. And so we would just ask that you would forgive us our sins. You said in your word that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, we don't completely understand your sovereignty And how some of our prayers are answered and some are not answered. God, give us faith to trust your hand even when we don't understand. Help us to remember, recognize, and rest in the truth that all things do work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. In Christ's name we pray.